Dear God, we are grateful for the opportunity to prepare for the first coming of Jesus Christ as we look carefully at the second coming of Jesus Christ and, and what that means for us here and now and there and then in the future. Uh, so I pray that you'll come alongside us and help us on this journey. I pray for each person here to receive a message um, that you need them to hear regardless of the words that come out of my mouth and help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life and the lives of those who are gathered here on this day. In Jesus' name, we all agreed and said amen. So in the season of Advent, part of what we do is we, we go back to the future. That is, we remember that Jesus is coming back in final victory and glory at the end of time before we celebrate the first coming of Jesus. Um, Bishop Will Willimon, a United Methodist pastor, uh, remembered a story from early on in his ministry. He was serving in a small rural congregation in Georgia, and, uh, and one day he went to a funeral at a church of a different denomination. And uh, Willimon uh, grew up in a big city church, and he had never attended a service quite like this. Uh, there was an open casket, not just before the service, but throughout the whole service, and, and the pastor kind of hovered over the open casket, and, and really, it was just one long sermon. That was the whole service, and the pastor would pound on the pulpit and would yell at the people, and he'd look out over the casket, and he said, oh, it's too late for old Joe. He, he might have wanted to get his life together, but it's too late for old Joe. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family, but it's too late for old Joe. He's dead now. It's too late. But it's not too late for you. There's still time for you. Today is the day of decision to follow Jesus Christ. You're still alive. And then he, he went on to preach, and he told this story about how on one occasion a, a Greyhound bus had run right through the middle of a funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. And he said, that could happen today too. Any day that could happen. You should decide to follow Jesus today. Today is the right day of salvation. Get your life together today. It's too late for old Joe, but it's not too late for you. And Will Willimon came away from that, from that service so angry, so hot. He couldn't believe that service. And on the way home, he turned to his wife and says, have you ever seen anything so manipulative and insensitive and disgusting? And his wife thought about it, and she said, well, no, honey, I've never really heard anything quite like that. Um, you're right. It was manipulative. It was disgusting. It was insensitive. And worst of all, it was all true. It was all true. It was totally unsophisticated and completely and altogether accurate. You see, we act as if we have all the time in the world to get our act together, that we have all the time in the world to get serious about following Jesus, that, that we have all the time in the world to get our lives together. And last week, we looked at, at a church, a new baby church, only probably been around for a few months, and, and, and Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonians. And he, he tells, it's, it's Paul's earliest letter. It's only about 15 years after the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the people begin to worry. What is taking so long for Jesus to come back and get us? And what happens to those people who die in Christ? What's going to happen to me when I die? And we talked about how there was a false teaching that developed about the fact that there would be no day of the Lord, there would be no reckoning, um, and that there was simply going to be a day when you would die, and that would be it. And Jesus isn't coming back. So stop waiting. Get over it. Um, and in the book Second Peter, that's written some 50 years after Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, um, he, he, we discover something interesting. They're still struggling with the same question. They're still wondering... In fact, the struggle with the false teaching has got even more serious, um, and, and they're wondering, and they're waiting, and they're worried. And for context, um, there's this word um, in, in verses 3 and 4 of 2 per Peter 3 that helps set things up. It says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in these last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, uh, what happened to the promises that Jesus is coming again? 
from before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. And that's like saying, hey, you know what? Give it up. Forget about it. It's a pipe dream. Jesus isn't coming back. Um, recently, I heard a prominent pastor. He, got, he stood in front of people and he said, he said, I love this book. And it's good to love this book, right? And he said, I love this book. And then for the next 45 minutes, he went through a process of talking about all the things that were wrong with this book, all the ways that it got some facts of history wrong, talked about all the ways that, that it was missing the mark and wasn't relevant for um, our life today because things have changed and because we needed to simply move on, especially in recent years. And I, what I heard was somebody who was scoffing and mocking the truth, who was simply more invested in his own personal preferences because I didn't see somebody who, who loved the book. I saw someone who loved his idea of what he thought the book was supposed to say. But he wasn't loving the book as what God intended to be, which was the very word of God. Um, thanks be to God for his people. The book needs to be seen on its own terms and its own values. You may remember um, a couple months back, um, Dr. David Watson, a New Testament scholar, we read his book together, Scripture and the Life of God, uh, Why the Bi Bible Matters Today uh, More Than Ever. And, and one of the things that, that Watson says is the idea that there are parts of the Bible that we need to disregard or get rid of is nothing new. It is a theme we see again and again and again throughout church history. Every single time, it has been a mistake. When we start to peel off parts of the Bible we don't like or understand, we diminish the inspiring story that God has given to his church. Watson goes on and he says, he talks about not being ashamed of God's word. He says, I am not ashamed of the scriptures. I honor them as God's word given to the church to lead us into salvation. I am not ashamed of them, but I am chastened by them. I am sobered by them, I am convicted by them, and I am grateful for them. May it always be so for us here and now and in every generation to come in the midst of anyone who would choose to be a scoffer or a mocker. No scoffing and mocking, okay? That's a good word for the people of God. Here's 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 8 through 15. It says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. <clears throat> so now, a day being like a thousand years to the Lord um, is not an opportunity for us to engage our profound math skills and determine the precise date for which Jesus is coming, to, coming back to us. Jesus was abundantly clear. No one knows the time. He said, I don't know the time. Only the Father knows the time of when I will come back. It's a reminder to us that what seems like it's taking forever is only a day to God. And since it's now been 2,000 years, it's kind of like two days to God. Verse 9, the Lord isn't being slow about his promises, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, and then heaven will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Now, this isn't really as harsh as it sounds. Um, when we sing the song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, there's a, a verse there that says, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. That's Second Peter chapter 3. That's what he's talking about right there in the song. But then in the song, it goes, it goes on and it says, but the God who called me here below will be forever mine. See, in the midst of, in the, midst of the reality uh, of the new heaven and new earth coming, um, we receive this as a word of grace and hope and love because God is forever mine. It is grace and hope, not anger and fear in the end of time that we long to experience and that we long for everyone to experience. And then Peter addressed how this picture of the end of time, how earth dissolving is designed to motivate us as Christ followers. 
Verse 11, he says, since everything is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set heaven on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But, but we are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth as he promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peacefully, living, living lives, living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord, the Lord's patience is given to times to all people to be saved. And then think about this, God's patience. I mean, we, we see this throughout Scripture. God is continuously patient with his people. I mean, picture a timeline of the entire um, Old Testament. I mean, there's thousands of years between when, when Adam and Eve come on the scene and then, then Noah shows up um, and then there's Abraham and Sarah <clears throat> and they show up in about 2100 BC before, you, before Christ. A few hundred years, we have um, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and then a few hundred more years, about 1500 BC, we have Moses shows up on the scene to lead his people to the promised land to rescue them from their oppressors. About 100 years later, the Israelites enter into the promised land. A couple hundred years later, the period of the judges, we see Deborah is this great judge over, over the kingdom of Israel. And, and we're going through the book of Judges right now in our soap, the daily devotional. And you'll notice there's this interesting pattern in the book of Judges that just goes time and time again where the people are disobedient. They, they uh, run from God. They, they choose their own personal preferences and go their own way. They experience consequences for their behavior. It goes on for a while, then they cry out to God. God raises up a judge, someone to rescue them. The judge is incredibly imperfect and messed up in their own unique ways. But during the period, there, there's a, a kind of a, a period of peace that ensues. And then the cycle happens all over again. They disobey. Um, they got, get consequences. They cry out to God. God raises up another judge, someone to rescue them. And the, each one of the judges is a picture, an imperfect picture of the perfect rescuer, the perfect one who's coming for us in Jesus Christ. And that happened 1,350 years before Jesus was on the scene. Then, um, then we see uh, uh, a couple hundred years later and King David comes on the scene. Um, and, and, and he, King shows us a picture of, of what it means to be royalty and, and that Jesus will come in his line and be royalty for us. A couple hundred years later, we see the story of the book of Jonah. Um, and, and Jonah comes as a reluctant prophet. He says, I, I don't want to go and let those people experience God's grace. And so he goes and he gives the worst sermon in the history of sermons. And he very quickly and abruptly says to them, God's going to take all you people of Nineveh out if you don't repent. And then he walks away. And you know what the people of Nineveh did? They fell on their knees, they repented, and they came to the Lord. And it was like, wow, okay, even though, even though that's not what Jonah wanted to happen, he still followed through and, and, and did what God asked of him with great reluctance, and God still worked. A couple hundred years later, the, the Israelites were all led into exile. They were disobedient, they lost the promised land, and they were carried out in a new place. A hundred years after that, we see that Nehemiah comes back and rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem so that people can come and, and have a safe place to be again. And then, and then there's this interesting 450-year period of silence called the intertestamental period. It's just, it's just quiet. God, God's not speaking. People aren't listening. And then Jesus, the Son of God, is finally born in the most humble surroundings imaginable. And people have been waiting for the ultimate rescue, the ultimate redeemer, Jesus Christ, to show up through all those years. They've been crying out for a savior. And, and it's been literally thousands of years that they've been crying out. And Jesus is the true and perfect model of the redeemer that they've been waiting for all those years. <clears throat> and here's how the New Testament describes Jesus showing up at that time. <clears throat> Romans 5, 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. 
2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, for God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. 1 Timothy 2, 6, Paul says, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave the world at just the right time. Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Now, I want to submit to you, if God was abundantly patient in the first coming of Jesus Christ, is there any reason why God wouldn't be patient in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Or as 1 Timothy 6.15 says, for at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven <clears throat> by the blessed and only almighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords. How many of you are familiar with the phrase that, it, it, forgive me in advance, it's wildly politically incorrect and probably quite inappropriate today, but it's still a popular phrase. Um, and is that like, it, it ain't over till the fat lady sings? You familiar with this phrase? Um, well, this is an interesting phrase. It's, it's based on, um, <clears throat> on a Wagner opera, and Don Meredith, who was a Dallas Cowboys um, quarterback in the 60s and an announcer for Monday Night Football with Howard Cosell in the early 70s, um, he popularized this phrase and it meant the game's not over until it's finally over. And the, the fat lady singing is in this Wagner opera, so it's weird that he would be the one who, who came up with that reference. But... But here's the way that from the opera, there's, there's a, this, let's say, a, a very large-boned, healthy woman who, who sings a song near the end of the opera. Now, the way that I remember this opera was popularized, and some of you will remember the same thing, was, was Bugs Bunny prayed, played Brunhilde in the opera. There. Now, that's how I remember this incredible opera from Wagner. Um, but, but the story goes that that Brunhilde, um, in, the, in the, the story of the Valkyries, she is, she's belting out this tune just before the end of time, okay? Once she finishes the song, uh, the destruction of the planet's going to come. Now, here's the thing. The reason why she needed to be a big-boned, healthy lady is because the song's 20 minutes long. So, just because the big-boned lady starts singing doesn't mean that things are going to be over anytime soon. All right, so what I hear Peter saying in this text is, okay, yes, the woman with the large bones has started singing, um, but, but things aren't over yet. It doesn't mean the opera's over anytime soon. It doesn't mean that, that there aren't still, we don't have time to wait. Uh, the reality is that God will bring the end to pass in God's own good time, and we simply have to wait in an active and meaningful way. You see, in the meantime, what do we do as we wait? Well, we keep singing with the big boned lady. And singing for us means serving one another. It means loving one another. It means growing in holiness. It means, it means doing ministry and mission in a way that honors God. It means coming alongside uh, Jesus in the recognition that, that we want more of him in our life continuously. And that's part of what it means here. We, we keep singing. See, whenever, whenever people think that, that Jesus... Um, is slow to return or that, that somehow we're better off knowing the act, exact date and figuring that all out. I like to remind people that, that every person in every generation of history up until this very, very moment has met Jesus the old-fashioned way through death. Um, and that means for 2,000 years, individual people have been experiencing their own individual moment of the second coming of Christ into their life. And it's often come suddenly and unexpectedly, like a thief in the night or a greyhound bus. And, and Peter wants us to be abundantly clear that the second coming of Jesus is not primarily designed to bring us to the point of fear and judgment at the destruction that's on the way, but it's the joy of restoration. It's the new heaven. It's the new earth. It's that God's design is going to be fulfilled, and it's designed to drive us 
to our knees in repentance and to get us up on our feet in joyful service. See, instead of following our own desires, instead of scoffing and mocking and refusing to be held accountable to the standard other than our own personal preferences, we are invited to life with God. That is, we are not justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone with an option to sign up for holiness if we so choose. Okay, the, the, the holiness package goes with the salvation package. Um, when you sign up to say, Jesus is my Savior, you're signing up for Jesus to be your Lord as well, to walk with you, to grow every single day. And so, so godly living more than the end of time is what Peter is trying to get us to understand here. And what's the point here? God's desire is clear. He wants all people to repent before the day of judgment comes. And one of our core values here at New Hope United Methodist Church um, is to live out the truth with grace. Not one without the other, uh, not one more than the other, and always in love. You see, if we try um, to live out uh, grace and ignore the truth, we're being nice and we're only helping ourselves and other people stay lost in their own personal preferences. If we try to live out the truth and forget about grace, well, we're settling in for, for a life filled with rules and regulations and compliance, and we're missing out on a living relationship with Jesus Christ and helping other people have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And both are epic failures of discipleship. See, uh, winking at sin fails to prepare us for heaven. But refusing to embrace God's grace and forgiveness um, no less is a failure as we prepare for the end of time. Because we believe that there is day coming that the full reign of God will mean that there are no more tears, no more sin, no more suffering, no more death. And that's why we keep singing and serving. We freely get to join God in his work that's happening all around us as we move toward that great and glorious day that is on the way in the future at the end of all time or at the end of our own time. Either way. We've got to get ready to meet Jesus, right? Goes with the territory. One of the, one of the things that, that I, love, I love about our bulletin is it's kind of a, it paints a portrait. It gives us a picture of all the different ways that we can, we get to come alongside God on the journey of faith, about how we get to, to keep singing. Um, last week, we talked a lot about the new ministry, Zoe, uh, of creating like ways for, for um, children in Africa to, uh, to not live a life of poverty, and we're helping with that. What a great ministry. We, we talk about, uh, I mean, we've got uh, Family Promise just here recently. What a great ministry to help people uh, hand up, not a hand out in the process uh, of God's grace in their life. New Hope Dinner Church in Orient Park. Um, where they tell the Jesus story and people are, are growing and coming and having fellowship and it's a great group of people. We got a great Hispanic ministry happening in Dover with, with migrant workers. It's a rich and powerful blessing in the life of our church. The gift of hope right here in Brandon this week. Please see Carolyn, get signed up to help with that. The Cuba trip. I love that one of the things that we're doing in Cuba um, this time around is, is we're bringing fresh water. One of the, the great images of the New Testament is of Jesus is the living water. So we're going to literally give them clean water, and they, they have a tool to share the living water of Jesus Christ because of literal water. How about maybe somebody simply needs to be invited to the Christmas Eve service with you, which are at what times? Three, five, seven, and nine. Very good, very good. Trying to make it as easy as possible. Perhaps it's something that we're not doing yet, that, that God's been tugging at your heartstrings to do or to lead. Um, you know, if, if God gives you the idea, he probably wants you to lead it or be a part of the team to lead it. So I love when people come in and they say, you know, there's something that we're not yet doing that I feel like God's calling me to start, and, and that, that's a great thing. 
especially when it, when it is in, in line with our mission to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's awesome. Whatever it is that we can do to join God where he is already at work is a critical and profound blessing. It keeps us singing and serving. I'm going to invite Josh and Daniel to come up, and they're going to they're going to sing uh, that song, play that song for us, that amazing grace, my chains are gone. And the reason is because I want you to see the way this song um, connects um, the, the end of time to the experience of God's grace here and now. Because as we wait for Jesus' final return, um, he's waiting for each one of us. He's waiting for all of us. See, um, God's not only being patient with those who have not yet received Christ. God's being patient with those of us who have received Christ so that we will be, get busy and spread the good news and help them hear that Jesus loves them and wants a living relationship with them um, and so that we can be in a process of growing closer to him. Because you know what? There might be a Greyhound bus coming. There's there already is a big bone lady who's singing and God is here and God is on the way in fullness. Amen.